just so you guys don't uh, forget, um, Chuck's message from last night um, was, was, if I remember the title correctly, it was called Bodybuilders. And the second part will be tomorrow. I bet it was a two-part. Um, so if you caught the first part, you're definitely going to want to remember to come tomorrow so you can catch the second part. If you didn't catch the second part, fear not. We have recorded it. So you can hurry up and get caught up on that before tomorrow night. Either way, I encourage you to come uh, tomorrow for the last night of the special services. And there, once again, will not be any youth group or any preteen class. It will just be the special service, and that's at 7 o'clock, okay? So uh, you can invite people, too. Don't, don't be scared of inviting people. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see that back there. But that is the picture. That is a picture of a cowboy <laughs> being dragged by another cowboy on a horse. <laughs> um, you know, I was I was putting the kids to bed, and uh, Micah got back up out of bed, so I was a little bit irritated. So I go back there, and uh, I step on a toy, and uh, you know how bad that 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 hurts, and it hurts. I think it hurts even worse when you're already irritated. <laughs> it's like it doesn't just go into your foot, it goes into your very soul. <laughs> that, that toy that you step on, it, it's an affront to your character. And uh, <laughs> so, so I got all mad, and then I realized that I'm the one who put it there. <laughs> I was getting him ready for bed, and it was on his bed, I put it there on the floor. So when he got out of bed and I came back in, I stepped on it because I was the one who sat it there. Now, granted, I mean, it was in, her, in his bed, but I didn't have to put it on the floor directly in my walkway either. I mean, I could have thought more strategically than that. Uh, Micah, you know, one, dad, zero. <laughs> but, you know, there's something, there's something in us that wants our problems to be someone else's fault. We don't like to accept our mistakes and our problems. There's just something in us that we want to be able to blame it on someone else. Anyone else, really. And, uh, I mean, you see the same thing happen very beginning of the Bible. First people in the entire planet. There aren't that many people. There are just two of them. And they still found someone else to blame. <laughs> the, uh, the man says it's the woman. The woman says it's a snake. Yeah, a talking snake. I'm sure you, there was a talking snake that told you to do it. Okay. What if your kid would have told you, told you that? There was a snake. And it, it told me to eat this, and it was a talking snake. Okay. So then the snake, you know, he's got no one else to blame it on. I mean, you're a talking snake. Well, we're, who's lower on the totem pole than you? I mean, come on. So, you know, we see, we see really the same pattern all throughout human history. Nothing really changed. So here we are, you know, thousands of years later. And uh, we still don't like to, like to accept our own mistakes, <laughs> our own uh, uh, problems. So let's look at James 1, uh, 13. James chapter 1, verse 13, and then through 14. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are easy to overlook that they're there. I mean, you can, you can know the whole idea of the Bible. You know, okay, read, read the whole Bible multiple times. You have a general idea of everything that's in there. And still find lots of little, little things that you never saw before. So James chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Okay, so that, that seems like we know what's being said. But yet, somehow along the way, we still get a little bit confused. Some of them, I, I've limited this to three specific things that people still try to blame their own mistakes on. First off, their spouse. You know how many husbands who look at pornography have blamed their wives? A lot of them. A lot of them. Maybe not all of them. I can't speak for every single man out there in the entire world. But I know a lot of them do. 
Well, my wife would have done this or that or the other thing. <coughs> okay. I mean, last year there were a lot of um, different media news stories, I guess you could say, of, of people being raped. And it was always someone else's fault, right? Well, if she wouldn't have dressed like that, then he wouldn't have raped her. No, <laughs> no, no. You, you don't blame the victim. <laughs> you, you don't blame the victim when they were the one who was... See what I mean? When you look at pornography, whose fault is it? Yours. You looked at it, it's your fault. There's no guarantee on sin that says everybody else is going to do everything right. And if they don't, that excuses you from doing the wrong thing. That's not what the Bible says. Um, people, who cheat, people who cheat on their spouses. You, this is a real big one. You know, I had an excuse, a reason why it's okay for me to cheat on my spouse. People who spend money very foolishly. You see people run their, run their credit cards right up. Well, they have reasons, right? They've been going through hard times, so it's okay to spend money that they didn't have. See, there, there's, there's, always, there's always something. It, it, somehow it's not our fault. I don't know how, but it's not my fault. I'm going to find some way that's not my fault. When we argue and fight, that's our fault too. And I'm talking more than just marriage here. I'm talking about um, church relationships too. When we, when we argue with people and when we fight with people, we don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to do those things to each other. And when we do... We're real good at, well, they started it. Well, then you continue it, so does that really matter? <laughs> I mean, I, hypothetically, everybody would act like Jesus. But sometimes we just don't really do that, do we? <laughs> so we have a lot of people who are people, and we have disagreements with each other because we're different. And then we take up some things, and this is my battle cry against this person, and they must suffer, and God must punish them. Because they don't see eye to eye with me. So the first thing, first thing is, is spouses. That's the first, the first person we love to blame stuff on. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. So that brings us to a second one that often gets the blame. It's called a spirit. Oftentimes a spirit of this, that, or the other thing. Um, there's a spirit of bitterness that needs to be cast out. Or there's a spirit of this, or... There was a while in church history where um, people, Christians really saw spirits I mean, behind every door, um, and under the table. I mean, they were everywhere. In fact, there was a book by, um, oh, not John Piper, um, John Eldridge. Ah, totally different person. There was a book by John Eldridge, and he was talking about spiritual warfare, and he had some great things to say. But then somewhere along the conversation, he got a little bit lost and started adding his own stuff in. Like, one thing he was saying was, you know, when you're going through problems, a lot of times it's spiritual warfare, which is true. But then he went off into the realm of weird. He talked about if there was, if you were sitting next to someone and they had a spirit sitting on their shoulder, would you be willing to cast it off of them? What? 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 Let's read this again, because I think that our imagination kind of gets away. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. See, there's a part inside of you that wants to sin and does not want to do what God wants you to do. Even if you're saved, there is still this part inside of you that does not want to take responsibility for your actions. So some anonymous spirit gets blamed for it. Poor guy. We don't have to cast out spirits, though. And I, we chose to sin. And the thing is, a lot of times to kind of validate our poor theology, because we don't want to change what we believe to what the Bible actually says, we find any little, any little chink in the Bible's armor that we can take something out of context to wield it as a sword to prove our point. You see, conspiracy theorists do it all the time. You know, they, they take a piece of, of the news and they, and they take that one little point that not all, the, not all the answers are there and they just twist it to say, see, 911 was caused by aliens. Any little, any little thing. And the thing is, we really have to be careful that we represent truth because we're Christians. 
Christians are supposed <clears throat> to be about truth. We're not supposed to be the people who blame our problems on someone else. We're not supposed to be people who just make up stuff to fit our beliefs. We're supposed to be people that seek God with their whole heart. So a lot of times we see spirits behind everything. One thing um, that I have here, uh, a good example is sickness. You see a lot, of, a lot of Christians get weird with this. There's actually a charlatan out there who's taken up the practice of supposedly writing. Now, I don't know if anybody here has heard of this, okay? So if you do believe in the charlatan, I'm not picking on anybody. But he has taken to the practice of getting David's songs, supposedly, and recording them at a different hertz level instead of 440, what my guitar is tuned to, for instance. He goes to 444, and then he claims that this has healing properties and sells it on a CD. Well, there's numerous problems with that theory. First off, the Bible never says anything about healing music. Second off, he couldn't have possibly gotten King David's music because none of the music of King David survived, only the lyrics did. Third off, King David didn't have access to the instruments that we have, nor did he have access to the tuning specifics that we have nowadays. It would have been impossible for David to have tuned to 444. Impossible. Unless he was able to travel through time, get a modern tuner, go back in time, and then retune his instrument, and then have somewhere preserved that music for this guy to sell online. But that has not stopped him from, from, from selling this stuff and making money off of people. See, a charlatan is someone who makes a financial profit off of someone's, someone else's not being informed. You know, people who have cancer are very, very, very distraught. And it's very easy to sell them hope because they don't have a whole lot of it. And that's exactly what these kinds of people have done. But sickness is a part of the world. We may not like it, but that's how it is. There was a cult called Christian Science. It was started by a woman, Mary Baker Eddy, if I remember her name correctly. And her main idea about the world was that everything in the physical world should be denied. It's just not true. It's an illusion. Um, you can say this in different ways, but there's... Basically, she denied Jesus, because Jesus was born of the flesh and of the spirit. If flesh is inherently evil, then Jesus was evil. See, she didn't think that one through. Second off, she denied sickness. She just simply denied its existence. Because I'm a Christian or I'm a believer or whatever, sickness has no hold. Okay, well, that's an interesting theory. But she died painfully of cancer. And it took her slow, painful death. doesn't really seem to work. In fact, Metallica wrote a song about the God who failed because his mom was a believer in the cult of Christian science, and no matter how much she denied the physical reality of sickness, she still died of cancer, and he saw it as God failed. But the truth is, she didn't read her Bible. She followed the cult because God said absolutely there's going to be sickness. In fact, if we deny the possibility of sickness, we are, in, in essence, denying God himself as a liar. Because in Genesis, he clearly, clearly said that there would be sickness. We, as Christians, will suffer with sickness. Sickness is inseparable from sin. Disease, decay, death is inseparable from sin. You might say, well, sin is a spiritual thing. Yes, but it has very physical, very physical repercussions. Sickness is a part of the world, but many try to ignore it. A lot of times people try to unlock secret power in prayer. Secret, I already mentioned the secret power in music. But the, the thing is here, Let me, let me back up. Pagans, you people who, you know, ancient cultists and that kind of stuff, they, they had a lot of rituals, and these rituals were focused on manipulating the gods to give them the answer that they wanted. And 
a lot of times Christians nowadays kind of do the same thing. We try to manipulate God into, if I say the perfect prayer, God has to heal me. If I deny the sickness, God has to heal me. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no power in hidden prayers. This is the power that heals us, the Holy Spirit. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and it's the same power that we always have access to. But it's not in us. And it's not found in music either. See, we try to lay, lay claim of the Holy Spirit and try to make him tame, where we can somehow throw a lasso around him and reel him down to our level. But that's not really how God works. See, here's God and here's us. And when we go through struggles, it's important to remember that God is still up there. See, just because God has come close to us, especially through the person of Jesus Christ, does not mean that he is not high and lifted up, exalted, greater than anything we could ever hope to accomplish or dream. Now, why doesn't he always heal us? I don't know. I don't know. Wouldn't it be awesome if he always did? Wouldn't it be awesome if, if all you had to do was believe in God and, and, and follow him and you would never have a problem on earth and you would never have sickness and things would just be great? But still there's this constant tug of war that's inside of us. Now, I'm not going to say that sickness is never caused from our sin, but I'm going to say that a grand majority of times it's not. In fact, in the book of Philippians, Paul tells us about a, a, a believer who almost died. His name was Epaphroditus. And uh, he was doing a good thing. He was taking some money to Paul in prison. That's a good thing. He was doing a good work. And then he got sick and almost died. It dragged on and on and on and on. He just didn't seem to get any better. And then, right when he was at, gate, at, at, at death's door, out of the blue... God heals him and he recovers. And Paul's like, I have sent him with this letter, letter to you, back to you, so you can see him and be happy. The sickness was a reality. Paul never denied that. So we cannot blame our spouses for our problems. We also cannot blame <laughs> some mythical spirit that exists out there somewhere. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The spirit, no, the spirit didn't make us do it. Our spouse didn't make us do it. And the situation didn't make us do it. We always have a choice. God will never put you in a situation ever where your only option is to sin. That's what the word says. God says that he will, al he will always make a way out to the temptation. What does that mean? That means there's never, ever, ever going to be a situation where you had to sin. You see, people get this a little bit confused, though. Don't they? Chuck mentioned this a couple a couple Sundays ago, and it blew my mind. I'm not going to mention the whole thing because you should just listen to the whole thing. But one of the things that he brought up was we like to say that there is no choice in our sin. Well, they made me do it, or this made me do it, but that's not the way it is. There's always a choice. See, the thing is, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. But if you blame it on something else, you cannot possibly confess it. Because confessing it says, I forgive me because I did this. This says, I did some of it, yes, but they did too. Once again, we're going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Yes, God, I, I, I kind of did sin, but they made me do it. If it wouldn't have been for what they did, it would. Let me, let me give you some examples so that we're not talking abstract ideas here. I had no choice but to worry. Because my teenager didn't come home last night. They were out all, all night, so I had no choice. I couldn't, I couldn't trust it to you, God. I couldn't. Because my kid was out all night. I had no choice but to be concerned, God, I lost my job, and you didn't, bring, you didn't give me another job. So I started to steal, and instead of trusting you, I, ha I have chosen instead to stop going to church and to stop seeking you. 
you kind of see the pattern. We love to blame other people. So how do we typically deal with sin? We justify our own while yelling, you sinner, to them. We all do it. Gossipers, they condemn homosexuals. At least I'm not a homosexual. The homosexuals, they blame the child molesters. The child molesters, they blame the murderers. And the murderers blame, blame well, at least I'm not a gossip. I and mean, at least I'm not one of those hypocrites in church that gossip. It's always someone else. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Lord, I did this. Please forgive me. That is repentance. So three quick things that you can do. First off, pray for them and pray for you. When you're having problems with people in the church, when you're having problems with family, whatever, it doesn't matter. Pray for them and pray for their well-being. You know, have you ever heard that song? I pray your uh, car breaks down. <laughs> I pray that uh, nothing good happens to you. I forget the whole song, but, you know, the music video is hilarious because the, the, this pot falls down on them, and it's just all kinds of funny stuff. It's a country song. Yeah, I mean, duh, of course. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm praying for you, and I, man, oh, man, I love that song because that's exactly what, oh, no, no, I, I'll pray for my enemies. God, smite them, smite them. Oh, did they, oh, just zap them with lightning. So pray for them, but also pray for you. Pray to have victory. Pray for them to have victory. If you've lived, people have wronged you. And oftentimes we sit there and, and we convince ourselves that it's okay to hate them because of what they've done. But I want you to imagine if God really did go through on what you've asked him to do. Okay? Punishes them, sends them to hell, they spend the rest of eternity in punishment. Is that really something that you want? Have they really offended you so bad that that's what you want? If so, I think the problem might be you. See what I mean? Stop blaming other people for your bad attitude. Pray for them and pray for you. Pray for their well-being. Sing it off love. I mean, that's something that just never really loses its application. Love others even if they never change. Even if they never heal. Even if they're always incomplete. Even if they're always a failure. Even if they never get it right. Love others. Because I'll tell you something, even if you were to never change, even if you were never to heal, God still would have died for you. And he still would have chased you all the way to hell and back. Never forget that. Never forget that. There's a, an old saying that is always good to remember, there I go, but for the grace of God. Yeah. Never underestimate God's grace. Love others and seek God. Seek his glory. Sometimes we get used to the same monotonous thing. But, you know, God wants us to move forward. God wants us to have more victories. He doesn't want us to be a people that relishes on the victories of the past. He wants us to move forward. Well, our church isn't big enough. You'd be surprised what God can do with a very few people. Through one person's prayer, the rain stopped for years in Israel because one person prayed. I don't think he needs a big church to do great things. I think he needs willing individuals. So in conclusion, just a few very quick points. I'm done. Our lives are not our own. Our lives are God's. And we have to remember that when we are trying to blame other people for our own mistakes. Our lives are not our own. Don't hold on to bitterness. Number two, we are to love others. This is just, I, I, I know I just said this, it's something that just kind of needs to be repeated because we make excuses for why we don't always have to love. In fact, Michael W. Smith has, came out with a song uh, in it last year about it. It's called Love Always Wins. When you're in a conflict, love always wins. Face it with love. That's, that's the way you truly win. <coughs> we are to love others. Well, I tried that. Well, evidently not if you stopped. 
love doesn't keep record of wrongs. And lastly, we are to confess our sins. Don't let your sins drag you away. Don't let bitterness drag you away as you blame everybody else for your own mistakes. Confess your sins to God and he will forgive you. Blame it on someone else. And he won't. So we're going to close there. Um, one of